Chapter 13 There was a long, heavy silence in the room between the two old friends. Sam's breathing became labored, and when he finally spoke, his voice was harsh and rasping. Say that over again, Pat? Seems like I didn't hear you very good. I didn't have anything to do with Ezra getting out of jail last night, Pat repeated quietly. I didn't know anything about it till just now. I thought he was still locked up, and I hoped to God that he was, he added bitterly. Well, then who did it then? Who tied up the deputies and busted Ezra out? I don't know, groaned Pat. I don't know nothing about it. I rode straight home from the Gold Eagle. Well, then how come Sally's telling folks that you done it? Well, I don't know that either. Pat admitted, I slipped in to get my guns and she woke up and I had to tell her the whole story and I said I was riding out to do what I could to get Ezra out of trouble so maybe she thought I meant that I was going to hold up the jailhouse. Yeah, and then when she heard he was turned loose by a masked man about your size she decided it must have been you that did it, Sam assented laboriously. Who could have done it, Sam? I don't know, I... I don't know nothing no more, except that Ezra couldn't have done them things they say he did. Not old Ezra. Pat Stevens didn't reply. His shoulder pained him and his head was throbbing anew. I don't care who claims they seen him, Sam went on resolutely. That page boy ain't no more than six years old and Jake Morton's mech's hand don't understand English so good. He probably got mixed up in what Jake was saying while he was dying. What about George Kincaid? Pat demanded. He's old enough to know what he sees, and he ain't just repeating what someone else told him, not according to Oscar Penrose. George, he's drunker than an owl hoot last night, Sam said disgustingly. I don't reckon he knows what he all saw at all. Look here, Pat, he went on fiercely. You don't believe it? You ain't taking sides against Ezra, are you? Pat hesitated, and he lowered his voice and asked, Where's Kitty? In the bedroom yonder, Sam nodded towards the closed door. She ain't feeling so good when I rode in from Dutch Springs this morning, and she's been laying down. Asleep, I guess. Not feeling so good? Pat's voice was instantly worried. You don't reckon it ain't her time yet, is it? For the baby? Nah. no. Nah. Sam sounded quite sure about it, as though he had been a father many times and knew all the ropes perfectly. Doc Trimble was out to see her last week, and he says twas be a couple more weeks yet, most likely. He said not to worry none till she started, you know, to hurtin' bad. Pat replied, Yeah, I know, I just hope the Doc's right. Was he sober when he looked at her? Well, he's per he was pretty nice sober. Sam said cautiously. I just don't want her to hear any of this, Pat explained, because what I'm going to tell you is something you and me can't tell nobody. Not till we know the straight of everything. He paused and took in a long breath. I've seen him, Sam. Who? Ezra. The hell you say when? Where's he at? Hold up a minute protested Pat. I didn't say nothing about it because I wasn't rightly sure, and I hoped it was some sort of a dream. I thought Ezra was locked up safe in jail and couldn't have been him. Hold on tight to your chair, Sam. You're not going to believe this. It was Ezra that done this to me, or else he's got a twin brother running around shooting people, he added darkly. You mean... Ezra shot you? That's what I mean. Pat sighed deeply and went on to explain. When I turned Ezra over to Triple last night, I figured on quieting things down and letting me have a chance to fix things up a little. I knew if there was VX cows in Ezra's pasture, they had been put there by Harlow to cause trouble. So I headed that way and messed things up a little more by driving some of my stock into Harlow's place, and I left a gap cutting the fence between the VX and Ezra's ranch 
so that we could have claimed that the VX cows were drifting through the gap without Ezra and knowing they were there. Well, that's good figuring, Sam approved. But I thought it'd be better yet if I could fix it to get the VX stuff back where they belonged. Pat explained. And I was waiting till daybreak to try and cut them out. So I rode to Ezra's new ranch house and I boiled me up a pot of coffee while I was waiting to get light out. And now here's what happened near as I can make it out, being that my head's kind of all jumbled up still. He went on to graphically tell about hearing the rider come up and how he recognized Ezra in the doorway and called to him just before the shot was fired. And then I went down to the floor, he related, and got knocked on the head and I passed out. I stayed out cold till past noon, and when I come to, I wasn't sure how much was real and how much I'd sort of dreamed up. I headed over here to see you and get you to tell me that Ezra was in jail, that I must have been dreaming about him. Instead of that, you tell me he broke out of jail last night, and then Oscar comes along and tells us all this other stuff. Pat waved his uninjured hand helplessly in the air. Well, I, I don't believe it, said Sam flatly. Not none of it, and you don't believe it neither, Pat. You and me know Ezra wouldn't do none of them things. It's got to be a damn lie. Not if he was in his right mind, he wouldn't. Pat agreed. Well, we've got to believe in him, said Sam fiercely. The whole rest of the valley's turned against him, and you and me are the only ones left. I'm all mixed up in my head, Pat confessed miserably. I have been ever since I've come to. It seems like I can't think straight. Of course, I know it wasn't Ezra. He went on more strongly, even if I did see him with my own eyes. Must have been the devil himself fixed up to look like Ezra just to make more trouble here in the valley. The voice of a woman came weakly from the closed door of the bedroom. It was Kitty Sloane calling. Sam! Come here, Sam! Her voice held a high-pitched tone of fright that startled the two men. Sam jumped to his feet and muttered, I better go see, to Pat and then hurried to the door. He went in and then closed it behind him. Pat settled back on the pile of buffalo hides and made himself another cigarette. Resting easily in the rude sling, his left arm was feeling better, and he found he could use the fingers of his injured hand as long as he held the shoulder still. He forgot about Sam and Kitty in the other room as he concentrated on Ezra and the terrible accusation against him made by Oscar Penrose. Sam was right. He and Sam had to believe in Ezra. They were his friends. They knew he couldn't be guilty of the atrocities charged against him. They were his only close friends. That was the trouble. Other people didn't know him as they did. Terribly conscious of the disfigured ugliness of his scarred face and one eye, Ezra had always shunned intimate contact with people. He was always afraid they pitied him, and he didn't want to be pitied. This gave him the reputation of being queer, and only Pat Stevens and Sam Salone knew the true greatness of the big man's heart. It was a shock to Pat to realize these things suddenly. He had never thought much about how other people regarded Ezra, but now he saw that it was terribly important. Not knowing the big man as he and Sam did, they were quick to think the worst of him, and now mob violence was about to result. He looked up quickly at the door from the bedroom as it opened. Sam came out and closed it behind him. He stood with his back against the door and looked at Pat. In the shadowed room, his dark face looked tired and drawn, as though he was tormented by indecision and fear. He said, Kitty, and then paused and wet his lip. She's a Pat. She thinks I ought to get Dr. Trimble in a hurry. Pat sat erect. You mean she thinks the baby's coming? Sam nodded miserably. I'm scared, Pat, he admitted hoarsely. She's she's hurting something awful, Pat. I, I don't see how I can leave her. Do, do you think you can maybe make it to ride, ride and get the dock? A shrill scream of agony came from behind the closed door. It's keen sharply through the evening stillness, 
raising the high note of hysteria and then ended abruptly as though Kitty Sloane had thrust something in her mouth to shut off the sound. Sam started as though a knife had been thrust into him. I'm scared stiff, he muttered again. God almighty, Pat, if, if anything happens to Kitty... Pat got to his feet, his face set in lines of stern decision. Get a roaring fire going on the stove, he flung at Sam. Bring in some buckets of water, and then you ride like hell for town. You roust out Dr. Trimble, and bring him back here drunk or sober. Can't you go? Seems I had best stay, stammered Pat. What do you know about having babies? Pat demanded scornfully. I can help a little. I was there when Doc was born, besides which, the way people feel about Ezra, and thinking it was me that turned him loose, they'd like as not have shoot me or lock me up if I showed my face in town. Get that fire going. He moved forward, impatiently jerking Sam, away from the door as though another muffled sound of agony came from the bedroom. Don't be standing around like a glute, or maybe something will happen to Kitty. He jerked the door open and went in while Sam lunged towards the kitchen. The shade was drawn in the bedroom window and Kitty's face stared up at him through the dimness from her pillow. She had a double fold of blanket clenched between her teeth and her pretty face was contorted with pain and with the fight she was making to stifle her screams. Pat said, Good afternoon, Kitty. He made his voice sound quite cheerful. Sam, he's he's riding for the doctor, and I'll stay and sort of look after things here until they get back. Lucky I happened in, he went in soothingly. Handy to have an old married man like myself around at a time like this. Kitty's eyes were big and round and staring. Her face was very white, but she managed a ghastly smile and took the blanket from between her teeth long enough to say, I'm sorry, Pat. I can't stand it. I just can't. I, I didn't want to frighten Sam. Sure you don't, said Pat. Try to hold out till he's where he can't hear you. Then you just holler your head off. He reached out his right hand and pulled the forty-five from his holster on his left hip. He broke it open and shook the heavy lead nose bolts from his c- cylinder and handed them to Kitty. You take a hold of that with both hands and squeeze it when the pain comes. That's what Sally did, and it seemed to help a lot. I'll get Sam heading for the doctor, and then you won't have nothing to worry about. He turned and went out of the bedroom into the lean-to kitchen. A fire was beginning to roar in the wood range, and Sam came trotting in, panting under the weight of two buckets of water from the pump outside. Is Kitty, is she all right? He demanded hoarsely. Pat laughed with a lot more reassurance than he actually felt. Right as rain. That's enough water for now. I can fetch more one-handed if I need it. Throw a saddle on your fastest horse and ride for town like you ain't never rode that express route before. Or maybe you'll be a papa before you get back. Sam nodded wordlessly. He went out the kitchen door as though propelled by a catapult. Pat lifted an iron stove lid and inspected the fire. He laid on a few more sticks of wood and partly closed the rear draft, and then hunted around for Kitty's biggest dishpan. He put that on the stove and filled it with one of the buckets, and then set the other full bucket up beside it to heat as well. He hesitated a moment, and then carried the empty bucket out to the hand pump and began to awkwardly refill it. He didn't have the faintest idea why it was so, but doctors and women always seem to want huge quantities of hot water on the stove as an essential preparation of childbirth. It had been that way, he remembered, when Doc was born, and when it was almost over, most of the water was still on the stove, and he never had been able to find out why they wanted it. He had been bluffing Sam to keep up his courage when he pretended to know all about the mystery of birth just because he was a father. Actually, there had been two neighbor women and Dr. Trimble to take care of Sally, and he had spent three miserable hours out of the corral while that was happening. He didn't know any more about the process than a jackrabbit, but it wouldn't do to let Sam or Kitty know that. Sam went by him from the corral with a great thunder of hooves while Pat 
pump the bucket full. He was hunched over low over the withers of his startled horse, swinging a curt to get more speed out of him. Pat straightened up and grinned at the dust cloud that quickly hid Sam from his eyes. Funny, the way a man went sort of crazy when his wife was going to have a baby. The first one, particularly. It didn't do any good to remind them that it was happening all the world over to all the women of all time. A man always felt his first baby was different from all the others that had ever been born, and the tougher a man was, the more insensible the pain, the harder it seemed to be for him to stand seeing a woman being hurt. Pat chuckled as he got that far into his, into his ruminations, and then he started guiltily as he remembered Kitty back there in the house alone trying to stifle her screams. He picked up the full bucket of water and carried it back into the house and set it on the stove alongside the other bucket and then tested the shallow pan of water with his finger. He nodded approvingly as he jerked his finger out. He thought that ought to be enough water for the borning of a dozen babies. He went into Kitty's room and reported cheerfully. Well, everything seems under control, ma'am. Sam took off for the doctor like a scared rabbit. And you can let go all you're mind to now. Kitty was withering on the bed underneath a thin coverlet in rigid agony. Her bare arms were flung up over her head, and one hand was clutching the barrel of his forty-five, while the other convulsively clutched the butt of the weapon. She held the double thickness of blanket clamped between her teeth, and her breath was loud and agonized. Pat shifted uneasily from foot to foot and looked the other way. He was terribly embarrassed, but he didn't want Kitty to know it. He wondered if the baby was already being born and what he was going to do about it. He had attended the births of lots of calves and colts on the ranch, but he reckoned that this was sort of different from that. The convulsing passed, and the rigidity went out of Kitty's body. She turned her head to look at him, drawing in deep, sobbing breaths while sweat streamed down from her white face. Her eyes were enormous, and the intensity of her gaze frightened him. Did you say that Sam had, had gone? She asked weakly. Pat nodded and cleared his throat. Nothing to worry about with me on the job. I got scads of water heating on the stove, and he vainly tried to think of something else that should be done, but that was about as far as his sketchy knowledge went. You just, you just go right ahead and... Yell whenever you feel like it. You don't mind me. Why, I recollect when Sally was this way, John Boyd heard her over at his ranch. Kitty smiled and said, I'm, I'm all right now. The pains, they come and they go, you know. Pat didn't know, but he nodded wisely. Sure, you just lay quiet and rest yourself. I wish you'd lift the shade, Pat. He went to the window and lifted the shade. It was cool. It was sundown, and the first coolness of the evening crept through the open window. When he turned back, he saw Kitty regarding him fixingly. Her eyes were luminous and grave. You've been hurt, haven't you? Oh, just a mite. Pat glanced down at his shoulder. Not much more than a scratch. Ezra did it to you. Kitty's voice was low and flat and monotone. And he's killed some other people, hasn't he? I heard Oscar telling Sam, and then I heard you and Sam talking. You must have heard wrong, Pat told her. Ezra ain't done nothing wrong. There's just some bad mix-up, that's all. Kitty moved her head restlessly on the pillow. It seemed to Pat that her eyes were becoming glassy. I heard it all. I didn't tell Sam because I knew he didn't want me to be worried. If I die, you'll take care of Sam, won't you? You're not going to die, said Pat angrily. He leaned over the bed and put his calloused hands on her hot, moist forehead with what he hoped was a professional touch. You got a mite of fever, that's all. But, but you will, won't you, if I do? Kitty caught his wrist with fingers that seemed as strong as steel. And don't let him blame himself. I want him to know, Pat, that, that I don't care. Her voice strengthened fiercely. I want him to know that I'd do it all over again for the happiness he's given me. The only real happiness I've ever known, Pat. 
You tell him that. Promise me you will. Let me let him know that I didn't mind. Only, I just hope I can give him a son. That's all I'm praying for. And I would want him to name him Sammy. Oh, hush, hush that kind of talk. Pat was sweating as profusely as Kitty now. He tried to pull his wrist away from her fingers, but she clung to him with desperate strength. Her face was a serene now, and a sweet smile curved her lips. I hope it'll be over by the time Sam gets back. Don't let him grieve for me, and I'm, I'm sorry about Ezra. I, I best be staying to the fire, Pat said hastily. He pried her fingers loose from his wrists and went into the kitchen. He poked up at the fire and put on more wood. The water in the dish pan was already boiling. Why did women have to think about dying at a time like this? It was crazy. Other women didn't die. Kitty was young and strong. Well, not terribly young, of course, but she was plenty healthy. As long as there was enough hot water, why should she think she was going to be dying? Pat wondered if he ought to bring in another bucket just in case. He looked around for one, but couldn't find it. Kitty began screaming in the bedroom. The agony pulsed out between her lips rhythmically. Now that Sam was gone, she wasn't trying to stifle the sound. Pat thought that was probably a good thing. Sweat poured from his face as he searched around for a bucket. When he couldn't find one, he got a couple of iron pots and put them on the back of the stove, and he filled them with warm water from one of the buckets and took it out and pumped it full again with his good arm. He brought it back and wished he could think of something else to do. The top of the stove was completely covered with containers of hot water, and he guessed that was all any man ought to do. The pulsations of pain continued to come from Kitty's bedroom though they were less shrill now, as though she was getting a hold of herself again. He tiptoed guiltily across the kitchen and opened a, a covered door to a shelf where Sam always kept a bottle of whiskey. The pint bottle on the shelf was almost full. Pat lifted it down and worried the cork out with his teeth. He tilted it up and let the whiskey gurgle down his throat. Kitty's screams had now faded away to a soft moaning. Pat stood with the bottle in his hand and listened intently. It seemed to him like the Lord could have worked out a better way for bringing babies into the world if he had tried quite hard. He put the whiskey bottle up to his mouth again. A wild, delirious scream ran out from Kitty's room. It was different from her other screams. It held more of a hysteria and fright than pain, and she cried out, No, no, and it was as though she was speaking to someone. Pat dropped the whiskey bottle onto the kitchen floor and lunged through the living room door. His hand instantly went to his gun when he saw Kitty sitting upright in the bed, pointing a trembling finger at a man who had climbed through the open window into her room. The man was Ezra. He was naked to the waist, his face and torso were streaming with blood, and his single eye was gleaming madly, and his mouth was wide open, emitting laborious wheezing. Kitty was hysterical with fright, shrieking back away from him, and Pat's only thought was for her. He ran towards the window, shouting at Ezra to get back, and his gun was in his hand. Ezra didn't seem to hear him, or he paid no heed. He pulled himself over the low window ledge and dropped on the floor on all fours like an animal. Pat acted instinctively. Without planning it out, he only knew he had to do something fast to reassure Kitty. He swung his forty-five in short, vicious arc and brought it down on the top of Ezra's head. It thudded dully upon the red, matted hair, and Ezra collapsed on the floor in an inert mass. Pat turned, grabbed Kitty, and forced her to lay down. It's, it's all right, Kitty, he kept saying over and over again. It's all, all right now. He won't bother you. End of chapter 13